Climate change, habitat destruction and exploitation have led to the loss of half the Earth's wild animal population. Conservation strategies depend on accurate species location and population data, but surveying and monitoring animals over large areas can be challenging. I'm in Liverpool to find out how a heat-seeking drone is using astrophysics and artificial intelligence to help protect endangered species. A multidisciplinary team of astrophysicists and ecologists at Liverpool John Moores University have been developing the drone technology. Claire Burke has been part of the research group for the last three years. Hungry little crew. <laughs> So Claire, does this look like a typical day at the office for you? This is one of my more typical days, yeah. Um, we try to get out here a couple of times a month if we can. Uh, really important for us to gather lots of data on the rhinos, so we're actually quite used to seeing these particular rhinos on a pretty regular basis, yeah. So you're an astroecologist, what is that exactly? Uh, this whole thing came about through a conversation over the back fence between two professors, a professor of astronomy and a professor of ecology. Literally over the back fence? Literally over the back fence. It might have been on the bus to work. I actually started life in astrophysics, looking at how the most distant galaxies in the universe formed and evolved. When I started my career in astronomy, I never would have guessed I would end up here today. So these days I am focused entirely on astroecology, the application of techniques we'd normally use in astronomy to help save endangered animals. So we have these beautiful specimens next to us, these gorgeous rhinos. Why rhinos in particular? What is special about these animals that your technology can help? In the wild, rhinos and other animals, they live in these absolutely huge game reserves. There are hundreds and hundreds of miles of land that's set aside for the animals. There's a national park in South Africa called Kruger National Park, where you will find things like these white rhinos and elephants and lions and giraffes. This national park is bigger than whales. Can you imagine trying to drive a jeep around there every day just to monitor where the animals are, never mind looking for things like poachers who might be hiding in the bush? This is an absolutely massive task. And wildlife monitoring is a challenge in itself because sometimes smaller animals than the rhinos will hide in the trees. With a drone, you can cover a much bigger area than you can on foot. With the thermal cameras, it makes it much easier to pick out the animals because they glow so brightly compared to their surroundings. And we disturb the animals less. There are only about 17 or 18,000 of these rhinos left in the wild, left in the whole world. And this is one of the most common species of rhino. For the other species, there are far fewer. So it's really important that we preserve these animals and make sure that, that they don't suffer from the effects of poaching. The research and development that will help in conservation efforts for endangered species like these white rhinos all happens at their innovative drone lab. So here's where it all happens. This is the drone lab. Fantastic. Very impressive. Hello back there. <laughs> this is where we do all of our technical development. Everything from the drones, putting them together, making all the hardware and software, talk, talking to each other and a bit of the software as well. We build all of our drones in-house. Uh, our engineers are experts in drone technology, so they build them from scratch. We also have the thermal camera here, which is attached to the drone. And what does the thermal camera pick up? So the thermal camera sees heat. If we were out in the wild, it'd be all of the animals out in the wild. And we are looking to see the animals because of their body heat. The light is being emitted from the animals directly, so we can pick them up. They, sh they shine really brightly. And, and they glow in the same way stars and galaxies glow out in space. Um, so we want to use the same techniques we use in astronomy to find stars and understand galaxies, to find and understand the animals down here on Earth. So is it the heat from the body that glows or something else? The thing that's doing the glowing is the, the heat, the body heat of the animal themselves. Um, we feel it with our skin as heat, but what it actually is, is it's light. Oh. It's a light that we can't see with our eyes, but the thermal camera can. So we are literally glowing with this light. So we're all made of stars, is a very famous line and song. <laughs> True, and we all glow like stars as well. In astronomy, 
Infrared cameras on telescopes have been used for decades to understand how the universe formed and evolved. The infrared astronomical images that are captured show the stars and galaxies glowing on a dark, cold background, and algorithms are used to find and classify objects of interest. Now, those same techniques are being used for picking up the glow of animals from above. So how do you then get your technology to do what you need to do in terms of ecology and conservation in the field? Mm -hmm. Once the thermal camera has seen an animal in the wild, uh, it's picked up its thermal fingerprint, its glow. Every different species of animal has a unique thermal fingerprint. They're warm and cold in different places on their bodies. So once we found this, we decided we want to train a machine learning algorithm, like an AI, to be able to tell the difference between different species of animals automatically as the drone is flying around using this unique thermal fingerprint. So the information from the drone comes from the camera and it will be processed by an algorithm. Uh, we have a tiny computer that lives in the box there on the drone that does all the processing live as the drone flies around and then it tells us what it sees. So for example in this room we're just seeing people. Out in the wild we will see rhinos, chimpanzees, orangutans, elephants, anything that's out there really. So different species have a different unique thermal fingerprint. So if the camera is on, so if I stand back here so the camera can see me, let's see if it recognises. Is it going to say human? 99% person. It's 99% sure that I'm a person. Yes. So do, do people have the same thermal fingerprint? It goes by species. Every, every individual is unique, obviously. Um, so the pattern of warm and cold in our bodies is generally the same for people or for every different animal. But as an individual, you will have slightly different thermal patterns on your body to anyone else. Can you see my nose? Oh, yeah. Oh, got a really Why is cold your nose, nose dark? Oh. So if people tend to have really cold or really warm noses. I don't know why I haven't spoken to an anatomist about it. Interesting. Um, Your nose looks like it has frostbite. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter how warm I am, my nose okay. always looks cold. Whereas if you stand in front of the camera, you might, yeah, have, a I might have a warm... I have a warm nose. So you have a warm nose. I have a warm face, the entire mm -hmm. face. But I'm going to put my hand on my chest to see if it leaves behind a heat handprint. Yeah, mm. look, it leaves the heat behind. That is so funny. Mm. And of course, hair doesn't emit any no. heat. It's very good at keeping your heat in. Right. Your hair is a very good insulator. It's really good at keeping your body heat in. Even though your head is really warm, yeah. it looks like your hair is very cool. Well, let's get back to talking about this algorithm that's pretty genius. So what are we looking at here? This is what the thermal camera will see as the drone is flying around. Here we're looking at the chimpanzee enclosure at the local zoo. So you can see all of the, the chimps moving around, they're, they're much warmer than their surroundings, so that's why they're so bright and the, the background is so dark. Um, the machine learning algorithm is picking out each of the chimps because of their, their thermal fingerprint, um, drawing a box around them. So you can see here is labeled, this is a chimp, we've got some birds um, moving around, so they were, they were ducks in the water. So how does it work? This is the result of a machine learning algorithm. We have trained an algorithm to be able to recognize different animals. And the more images you show it, the better it will become at recognizing that animal or any other object that you want it to see. It takes a long time to train a machine learning algorithm. For it to learn what a new animal looks like, it has to see thousands and thousands of images of that animal. We can currently recognize 10 or 20 different species of animal. So just by entering data about the thermal fingerprint of each individual species, this camera is able to say, that's a baboon, that's an orangutan, that's a spider monkey, that's a chimpanzee. It literally is going to be species specific. That is the aim, yes. I know that a project you have underway at the moment is spider monkeys in Mexico. What's the purpose of that particular project? We're currently running a citizen science project. It's called Spotting Spider Monkeys. We flew our drone over the forest uh, a little while back, the forest in Mexico, looking for spider monkeys. Spider monkeys are really important for the forest because they eat fruit and they disperse the seeds around. But the spider monkeys, they move around a lot, they're hard to track. So we went and found a load of them with the drone. The comparison of drone footage with and without the thermal imaging shows just how effective the drone is. The footage will now be used to train the algorithm to identify spider monkeys so it can be used for monitoring the endangered species. Every animal is important for its ecosystem and it has a part to play and these ecosystems have evolved over hundreds of thousands of years to be in a really good balance with each other. If you lose one species of animal from that ecosystem then the whole balance is upset and large parts of the forest can suffer. 
Well, I'd love to see the drone in action. We go out to the local safari park, Nosley Safari is where we go and gather lots of data and we test our drone system as it is developed. Uh, we're going to go out there and gather some thermal data later on today. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I'm quite curious to see this drone in action now that we're at Nosley Safari. We have seen the images on the computer screen of the aerial footage picking up the glow of wild animals. I think to see it in action is actually going to be quite fascinating because we now know that there are plenty of species all throughout the safari and now picking them up in real time with the heat seeking camera mounted on the drone, I think it's going to be, it's going to deliver. Right. Flying the drone today will be Serge Chevich, a conservation biologist who I heard started the collaboration with the astrophysics department in quite an unusual way. The majority of my work is really trying to find animals, trying to monitor them. I was talking to Steve, my astrophysicist colleague at LJMU, uh, while we're in our backyards, because we're neighbors, about how we were going to analyze those data. And then he said, oh, I, I, can, I can help, uh, maybe. And I was like, oh, is he? Are you just being very friendly that you're willing to go through the data and, and try to, to look for animals? And being said, a good neighbor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then he said, no, no, in astrophysics, we use algorithms to look at stars because they are warm bodies against a very cold background. And then I was like, oh, that's what he means to apply the algorithms that they use in astrophysics actually to the animals in the thermal data that we get with drones. And that's the start of, of this rather odd collaboration between ecologists and astrophysicists. There's uh, my colleague Steve over there, the astrophysicist. The drones are all set up, so we should all be ready to go. And okay, collect he's some had data. time to set up all your equipment. Yeah, he's, he's a good guy. He does that. <laughs> hey, Steve, how are you doing? Hi, I'm awesome. Joe. Nice to meet nice you. To meet you. <laughs> You're now the famous neighbour who had the conversation over the back fence, is that right? That's absolutely <laughs> yeah. right, yeah. That's how this all got started. Isn't that fantastic? It's so lovely. You'd never put astrophysics and ecology really in the same place. Absolutely. And here you are working together. Yeah, never would have, before meeting Serge, I never would have put them two together. Yeah. Same here. It's, 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 yeah, really by chance that we are living together uh, or in the same street. The home point has been lifted. Take off. Okay, I'll take off. So, Sergei, your bib does say, drone pilot, do not disturb, but can I come and disturb you, Yes, please? you may. <laughs> sure, that's fine. I don't, want, I don't want to interrupt your concentration. Yeah. So what are we doing here today? So we're flying the drone to look at the thermal signal of the rhinos that are over there. Um, and as you can see on this screen, you can see that where it's warm, you can see, uh, yeah, that's where animals are you basically see a car here and the rhino over there. It's a little bit hard to see because of the reflection of the sun. But I'll fly a little bit further and... Yeah, let's see if we can find some rhinos. Um, there should be some rhinos here. Are they hiding from us? <laughs> <laughs> no. They're just a little bit hard to see. It might walk over there. Okay. I've got a little bit better visual over where the, I think where the, the green parts, which is not very warm, and then the whiter yeah. and redder bits are where it's warm. So probably here you see a rhino. Can you tell me about the first time you used this technology? Yeah, so we were one of the first using this technology for conservation work. And it's really something that happened because these systems became affordable and small enough that you could put them on a drone. Before that, they were just too large. Okay, landed. Excellent. Great, we've got some good footage. Nice. Yeah, excellent. Good yeah. Flying. We've all read the stories, I think, in the news and heard about the fact that white rhinos in particular, there aren't many of them left. So where do you hope this will go in future? 
Well, we hope that we can include as many species that are endangered in, uh, as we can get in, in our data set. And so that this system can be used in a wide array of settings around the world so that it helps conservation in, in not only in Africa and not only in one particular country, but in as many countries as we can apply this technology to. Astronomy is obviously fascinating. It's really interesting. We're asking the biggest questions about our place in the universe and how it came to be. But for me, taking all of that knowledge and understanding from out there in space and bringing it back down here to Earth to make a real difference to some of the biggest challenges facing the planet is the best thing I've ever done. Sometimes biologists feel like historians in a way that we're, we're documenting not the decline of a civilization, but the decline of our, of, our, our, of our biodiversity, of our environment. The planet, the survival of the human species depends on the environment. Without the oceans, without the forests, without a good functioning ecosystems, we won't do very well. We might survive, but it's not going to be as it is now. So we need to keep these animals there because they help to make sure that the forests are healthy. We need to keep these forests to maintain the carbon in them and to, to suck up more carbon from the atmosphere. So all these things are related. So to know how many animals there are, rhinos, apes that help disperse seeds to keep these forests and these ecosystems healthy, that will help us to survive in the end. So that's why this is crucially important for us.